Good morning. My name is Chuck Isaacs. I'm a retired combat engineer. I served from 1985 to 2001, uh, four years in Germany, and then the remainder broken up in time in, in Bosnia from 92 to 2001. I joined the military under a youth employment program. It was called YTEP, Youth Temporary Employment Program. And uh, I joined in 85 and I retired with a pension in 2001 as a medical release. Since retirement, I've run a successful advertising specialties company. And then I had some, some stumbling blocks and uh, I stepped away and I've been spending my time working on my mental health, and now I've stepped back into the organization as the president, and I want to hit the ground running. My information on Aboriginal veterans comes from a number of sources. Some of those sources are produced by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Some of them are just from reading books. My father was a, a Korean veteran. My two grandfathers both served in the Second World War. And right back to the Battle of Otosh, my uh, great great uncle was the last man killed, Donald Ross. I base my information on conversations with veterans and books, resources, movies. So my outlook on Aboriginal contributions or Aboriginal veterans may be different than many other people, but it's factual and uh, if you do the research, you'll see that it's valid. So initially, prior to the to Canada forming, as far back as the 1600s, Aboriginal people have protected the settlers from invasion or insurgency from the United States, from different countries that tried to invade. And uh, Back, you look back, the West Nile Voyagers is probably the first documented place of where Métis veterans went and fought with the British on a different continent. Then you look at the Battle of Botash even. I had family on both sides of that conflict. In St. Albert in particular, there was a group of men that were called the St. Albert rifles. They got together and set out to fight against the resistance. So, so that it's, it's varied. Uh, Métis people, First Nations people, Inuit people likely had people on both sides of that. It's like borders were fluid. It was Upper Canada, Lower Canada, and then later on Rupert's Land. And when people received script or or a treaty there was no there was no alberta until like the turn of the last century so people would travel from alberta to manitoba or saskatchewan to receive script so this was alberta was part of the northwest territories so you know when you have family that that had children in in winnipeg or its surrounding area, then in Saskatchewan, then in Buffalo Lake, Alberta, then down Turtle Island, South Dakota. It's like their Aboriginal peoples really had no border. They fought on both sides. They uh, acted as scouts. It's just they were considered to be equal to everyone else. For instance, during the First World War, First Nations people could fight it in the war, but they had to disenfranchise themselves. So they would sign away their treaty rights in order to be considered a man and be able to sign up and fight in the war. Veterans Affairs would put their numbers at, at like 2,000, but how would you have any concept of how many of them were First Nations or Métis or Inuit if before they joined, they had to distance themselves from that? There's anecdotal evidence but I think if you were to travel back to Europe and you look at the names on the headstones and you see, you know, Crowfoot, Little John, tons of Métis names that are there that I recognize as Métis from my own genealogy, if there 
referencing was actually done on each one of those people, at the time, the definition of who is Métis and who is not Métis is quite different than it is today. During the Second World War, while my grandfather served, my grandmother moved around. She moved around northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta, and she did that so that her kids wouldn't have to go to residential school. But in the meantime, they, they spent one winter in a chicken coop with newspaper over the windows and a small stove. And when food was scarce, she would scrape the chicken shit out of the cracks, wash the grain out of it, and boil it so they had something to eat. That was in the 40s. It wasn't until 1963 when Aboriginal people, First Nations people, were given the vote. In 93, there was still a residential school. It's like all of these reasons make it a strong argument for their estimation of up to 8,000 Aboriginal soldiers fighting in the war. I would place that estimate at probably 20% of the people that served were of Aboriginal descent. And considering the number of Aboriginal people versus the number of people in Canada, the contribution of the Aboriginal people was huge. Almost every Canadian forces base is built on ceded Aboriginal property. It's whether they were moved out of the uh, reserve or pushed off somewhere else to a less attractive area, or they gave it up willingly because some communities the Aboriginal people provided, I believe it's donations up to $20,000, which at the time of the Second World War was a lot of money. So out of their meager existence, they donated that much money to the war effort. So they wanted to be at the table. And because of that, when those soldiers came back from the First World War, there was, they helped set up the Métis settlements. They helped set up the Métis Nation of Alberta. They helped on just about every reserve and uh, treaty area in the province. And there's big names. When you look at the, the founding fathers of the Métis settlements or the founding fathers of the Métis Nation of Alberta, well, they, would, they would put the contributions very small. And there's an attempt to take the glory or rewrite the history so that Aboriginal people seem to play a very small part. But being a warrior culture, Aboriginal peoples were fitted for that. They often were the best, the best snipers, the best marksmen, the best sharpshooters. They had tracking skills. They, they had stealth, the invisible walking, and, and uh, they were used in those positions. And it's on the 8th of November, which isn't recognized in every province as Aboriginal Veterans Day, that is an effort to include those Aboriginal warriors that were not allowed at the table for so many years. And even today, even today on rural reserves and in rural areas, there's veterans that are hiding in basements because they can't face the world. There's no mental health for them. There's no one to go there and help them with their pensions with back. They're basically there. And because there's very few veterans in those rural areas, they're really kind of alone because they have that memory and that experience that it doesn't go away after you leave the service. You can learn to deal with it and there are treatments, but if you don't have treatments available to you, those people likely will not have the greatest outcomes. And that's something that, that I see as being a message for this year's Aboriginal Veterans Day is that the government and the communities have to do more to make sure that someone reaches out to these people and recognizes that they're veterans and make sure that they're being looked after as well as possible. I can be reached at aboriginalveterans.ca my name, again, is Chuck Isaacs. If there's any questions that anyone has, feel free to reach out to me. I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. 
Thank you very much for taking the time. Have a nice day.